all of you uh, for coming to this inaugural uh, workshop entitled, This is What uh, a Scientist Looks Like. My name is Doug Haynes. I'm a Vice Provost for Academic Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion and Professor of History. And um, this idea of this workshop uh, was the brainchild of two offices uh, and a group of faculty coming together. My colleague, Professor G.P. Lee, who's the director of Cal IT and professor of electrical engineering, as well as my colleague, uh, Professor Deborah Richardson, uh, a member of the faculty and founding dean of the Brent School of Information Computer Science. And part of the purpose of creating this series of workshops over the course of the academic year is to sort of broaden participation in our science, uh, uh, technology, engineering, math uh, majors with the idea of growing the innovation workforce. As most of you probably know, uh, President Obama, uh, as well as uh, the various science academies and UCI, among others, has committed to growing the science workforce. And we believe as a campus that one way, if not the best way to achieve this, is to reach out particularly to women who are interested in science and want to major in science fields. And so this series is about exposing you as much as possible to orienting yourself about being a major in a STEM field, about thinking about the research opportunities that are available here at UCI, as well as internships, and also to think about the future, to think about graduate education, if that's something you're interested in. What does that entail? What does it mean? And also to consider life after UC in industry, in the workforce. And so I think the purpose of these workshops is to sort of raise awareness about the possibilities that are available. And now what I'd like to do is to turn it over to my colleague, Professor Lee, who played an integral part in designing these series of workshops. Thank you. Um, so I'd like to uh, welcome you to uh, CAG2. Uh, first, I'd like to thank all of you for coming to this event. I think your participation makes a big difference. And i also like to thank my colleague, uh, Deborah Richardson. Professor Richardson is uh, really the uh, the godmother of <laughs> this event, and she is the one who really is a major champion for this event. And over the years, I have worked with her, and she's a great mentor. And if you have any question, she's the one who will be here always to support you. And lastly, I'd like to thank all the panelists uh, for your support of this event. I think it's your advice to uh, uh, all the new freshman students, it will be so valuable. And last thing I'd like to mention to you, in Cali too, we do have uh, lots of uh, research projects. I invite you later on to join those research projects. This is a way to enrich your learning experience at UCI, and also you will be able to uh, interact with uh, senior students and learn more about uh, from different disciplines, and that will really help you in your career as well. So welcome to UCI and Cali too. Without any further ado, we'd like to hand off to Professor Richardson, who will moderate the question and answers. And I'm going to start a little with a few facts and a little bit of information about why we're doing this. So the numbers say it all. In the United States, women hold less than 25% of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math jobs. In the UK, women now make up 46% of the, oh, and in the US, it's Women make up 57% of the workforce, but only 25% of the STEM jobs. In the UK, women now make up 46% of the country's workforce, but hold only 15.5% of the STEM jobs. So we're doing a little bit better there in some areas, but um, these numbers actually exclude medicine, where actually women are more equally represented. Um, and each year, the number of women studying and pursuing careers in technology goes down by about half a percent. So by 2043, at the current pace, less than 1% of the global tech for workforce will be female. Do we think that's a good idea? Come on, resounding no. No. <laughs> so I want to start with some 
more statistics and things and then um, talk a little bit about why we should care about this and why we're actually here trying to encourage you to stay in STEM. So in K-12 education, this felt like it went off, I guess I just wasn't, <laughs> didn't have my coat in the right place. Um, girls are taking most high-level math and science courses at rates that are similar to their boy male colleagues, peers. Um, and they're performing well overall. So in K-12, it's pretty good. We're doing pretty good. Um, in math, the percentage of females taking pre-calculus ana analysis was higher than that of males, um, as was the percentage of females taking Algebra 2. And about an equal percentage of men and women, males and females, boys and girls, take calculus in high school. Okay? More females than males took advanced biology. And males took physics at only a slightly higher rate than females. Okay, but when you start to look at engineering and computer science, men are about, boys are about six times more likely to take it in, in high school. So there's one place in high school where we have this, this differential <coughs> between disparity between males and females. But in higher, once you get to higher education, this really shifts. And that's what we're really trying to address here. So the gender disparities really begin to emerge, especially for minority women. So women earned 57.2% of bachelor's degrees in all fields in 2010, and 50.3% of STEM degrees, actually, in 2010. So that seems pretty good. But biology is the outlier there that makes that number come up to 50.3%. Because for bio, I don't remember what it, uh, I might have it here, but I don't. But I think it's something like 65% of biology degrees. So, um, but women's participation in STEM at the undergraduate level significantly differs by specific field of study. So over half of bachelor's degrees awarded in biological sciences go to women. Um, and they're close in mathematics and statistics, 43%. But when you start to look at computer science and engineering, it's roughly 18%. And as you can imagine, computer science and engineering are these fields that are booming right now and fields that we want women to be involved in. Um, when we look at the STEM workforce, women remain underrepresented, um, although to a lesser degree than in the past, so that's good. But the greatest disparities are occurring, again, in engineering, computer science, and the physical sciences. So women make up 58% of the overall workforce in the US, but female scientists and engineers are concentrated in different occupations. So 58% in the social sciences, 48% in biological and medical sciences, so about parity but relatively low shares in engineering and, and computer and mathematical sciences. So 13% in engineering and 25% in computer and mathematical sciences, but the real reason that is high is because mathematical sciences is significantly higher than computer sciences. But the BLS, the Bureau of Labor Statistics, clumps those together, so it's harder to kind of tease the difference between those two. So why does it matter? And that's why we're here. Um, those numbers are horrible. Um, we want to correct those numbers, but why do we want to correct them? Is it just because we want to be at parity, because we think it's important? I mean, why do we think it's important? So one is improving techno technical, technological innovation. Currently, we're missing out on value, the valuable perspectives of about 50% of the population and what they could bring to designing the next technology of the future, the next innovation of the future. So that's really important factor here because the perspectives of different people have a huge impact on what actually gets developed. Research shows that diversity improves problem solving, productivity, innovation, and ultimately the bottom line. So we need female perspectives to come to play into all everything that occurs um, from here on out. We also need to reduce social inequities. STEM jobs, and computing in particular, are among the fastest growing and highest paying jobs. Yet few women are benefiting from these occupations. This trend increases social inequities and barriers to women's future life opportunities. Women and girls need to have technology skills in order to thrive in the 21st century, since more than nine, even if you're not going into computing, more than 95% of jobs these days involve digital, have a digital component to them. So it's important that women understand all of that um, computational thinking and everything. 
It also teaches leadership <laughs> skills and critical thinking. So innovation in STEM courses and careers require you to speak up and explain your work, explain what's innovative about it. So it builds that critical thinking skill about what you're really doing and it builds your leadership skills. So that's another reason why staying in STEM, being involved in STEM is really important. You have to stand tall in order to be taken seriously in a male-dominated field, like most of these STEM disciplines are. And another problem in this domain is workforce exit. There's, I'm sure, I don't know if, you've, if you're aware of it, but there's lots of stories about women who leave, especially computing, because the workforce is just so abysmal to women in some, in some places. Not in all, but in some places. And we're, I'm involved in an organization that's, that's really trying to work to change this in, in the workforce. But more than half, 56% of women in technology, leave their employers at mid-level point, mid-career, um, after being in for about 10 to 20 years. And it's, you know, more than once you hear from a woman that they feel like a lone wolf. They're the only one there. There's nobody to stand beside them. There's no one to, to work with. So they find the technology to be very lonely. They may be the only female in the IT department or the only female in this field in some STEM field. And they just feel like they need to leave. So, all of these are reasons why it's really important that we kind of change the culture. And one way of changing the culture is changing the mix of the people that are involved. So that's why you're here. That's why we want you to stay here. Um, uh, you know, we're going to have the panelists talk, and some of them may tell stories about experiences they've had that are that are that make them feel like the lone wolf but they've stuck it out and it's really important to reach out if you have problems like that if you encounter any any issues in your classrooms or anything like that that kind of make you want to leave you know other than it's just not your passion that's one thing but we really want if this is your passion if you're interested in science and technology engineering and math stick with it because it's really important so now I'm going to introduce the panelists, and so that I can remember who everyone is, I'm going to come over here so I can read their name tags. Um, and then I'm going to ask them a series of questions, and then we'll open it up to the audience. So Zeppi um, is uh, from physics, but she just recently changed to double major in physics and engineering. Um, Chaitana. Chaitana is in the computer science and engineering major, so that's one major, but cross computer science and engineering is shared between the two schools. Um, Arlene is actually someone who got all of her degrees through the PhD here at UCI in engineering, and she's now working here in the Zot portal. She'll talk about that. Um, Diane is majoring in human biology, and Angela Lee is majoring in computer science and dance. <laughs> So, um, we'll just go down this way, and then I might switch it up a little bit and choose your questions. But first, I want them to introduce themselves, not their name, because I just did that. But tell us a bit about themselves. What's your hometown in high school? What year you're in? Um, why you came to UCI? And most importantly, most of you are in leadership roles or are doing research or something like that. So please tell us about those roles that you've taken on here at UCI. So, Hi, I graduated from Herbert Hoover High School in Glendale, California. It's about an hour away. Uh, I am a physics and engineering <coughs> major. Is your mic on? It is. Okay. Is that better? It's probably too far away, but go ahead. I think people can hear you. If somebody can't hear, raise your hand. So. What was the other question? Oh, <clears throat> sorry. It's okay. Um, why you came to UCI and what leadership roles, oh. research roles you're in. Okay, I picked UCI because when I was in high school, I already knew I wanted to do a STEM field since I really liked math and physics. Uh, I just wasn't sure which one I wanted to do. And I knew that UCI had a bunch of different engineering and sciences, so I knew if I was a little bit bipolar about my decision, <laughs> which I was, uh, I would be able to switch around. So that's why I came here. And I'm in two research groups on campus. One of them is with physics and the other one is with engineering. And I think it's a completely different experience than in class because you get to spend more one-on-one -on -one time with the professor and you get to work in smaller groups with older students. And you, get, you can ask them questions about graduate school, undergraduate school, uh, any 
questions you might have about um, different subjects you'll have to take down the road, and it's insightful. And I also think it it's more fun than classwork because it doesn't feel like homework. You get to work, you get to choose a project and work on it, and it feels more important. Thank you. Because okay. uh, it feels more important because you, uh, what you're doing is actually contributing to the group, whereas where you're just turning in assignments for a class, they kind of get put in a box and put away after that quarter. Oh, no, they don't. <laughs> I'm quoting one of my did professors on that. <laughs> did you say what year you were? I'm a second year. OK. Um, I graduated from Burbank High School. It's near Pasadena, if you guys know. It's in LA Valley. Um, I'm a fourth year computer science and engineering major. Um, uh, is it about leadership roles? <coughs> I'm currently the president for Society of Women Engineers, and I'm also a peer advisor for the School of ICS. Um, previously, I worked with Cal IT2 uh, Research. Uh, last year, I was in that uh, with Calgary Software Research Team. And like she said, it's a great way to um, get involved and learn all these skills that um, you might not be learning in your classes. Um, but at the same time, it's you know you're not taking it for a grade, but you have this assignment that you have to complete and. Um, you have to research on it. You have to kind of learn all these things. And so um, it helped me learn a lot of new skills that I didn't have before. Uh, but at the same time, it's not worth the grade. So you, you're kind of learning it, um, but no tension for you. So uh, I thought that was a great thing. Uh, I was also in, involved in other few officer positions in Engineering Stone Council and ICS Stone Council and things like that. But um, that was in my first two years. Arlene, how about we come back to you? Since okay. So Diane. Hey everyone, my name is Diane. I'm a fourth year human biology. So I also live in like the San Fernando Valley in Northridge. So those cities sound very familiar to me. Um, so the reason why I came to UCI it was actually a very odd decision that came from a disagreement. So initially I just wanted to go to a school near where I live. And it was a Cal State University in Northridge. So it would have been like two, three blocks, I'd just walk to school. And even with financial aid, I'd be funded to go to school. So that looked appealing to me. But my parents wanted me to kind of explore and kind of broaden my horizon. So to go to somewhere like UCI was like an hour or two away. And so initially I took that as, you want me to leave the house? Okay, fine, I'm leaving. And so <laughs> that's why I chose it. But it's a decision I haven't really regretted since I, since I made it. And so in regards to leadership roles, um, after establishing academics, I explored a lot of medicine field or like opportunities that revolved around clinical experience. So even I started research in, um, in the emergency department and so uh, I was able to do research during the summer through programs offered by Cal IT2 and also Europe. So those are definitely some things you guys should try as well. And then also recently I started um, doing research in organic chemistry because chemistry is something that always was appealing to me, but after taking organic chemistry and exploring it further, I grew a passion for it that I didn't expect. So it's kind of like combining medicine and both pure organic chemistry as well. So it's a, it's a different field entirely, but. Angela. Okay, hi, I'm Angela. I'm a fourth year computer science and dance major. So uh, I came from Northern California, uh, Mountain View, so it's right in the heart of Silicon Valley. And I chose UCI because um, I was uh, interested in continuing on with my dance experience. And UCI provided both like a really great dance program as well as a great uh, computer science program. Uh, more about the computer science program, uh, ICS, the ICS school offers a multiple a variety of different majors. And uh, in the best way, uh, the best thing about it for me is that uh, the computer science school offers kind of interdisciplinary majors as well. Like, uh, them, um, business information management, computer game science, informatics. So what attracted me most to UCI is because uh, they offered so many inter interdisciplinary majors. And um, in terms of leadership roles, I am the co-president of Women in Information and Computer Sciences, um, WIX uh, at UCI, and that's about it. And Arlene. Hi. Um, so. Unlike these girls, I was uh, in high school in 1990s. <laughs> 1990s. Um, At least so it wasn't the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> so, 60s, I should say. 
So I have, I have lots to talk about, um, but um, I was actually born out, outside of this country. Um, I was actually born in Africa and uh, raised most of my life in a country called Honduras and moved um, to San Diego during uh, high school and uh, was a little shy little rabbit there, really didn't explore too much in, in, in STEM fields, uh, but I knew I wanted to go into biology as my first major, just because I, I, I always think that life is such a, an interesting subject and, and kind of evolution in, in that sense. Um, but I chose UC Irvine just because my sister went there. So it wasn't anything strategic. I was just uh, like, oh, my big sister's there. She'll help me like uh, lead the way. And then, you know, I ended up just falling in love with the UC Irvine campus and loving the school so much that I came back here for grad school. Uh, and during that time, though, uh, a lot of, I didn't know what I was going to do. Like, I, I did almost every major. I was, uh, I went in biology, and then I decided, okay, I want to do double major. Let's just do chemical engineering. And uh, I even minored in environmental engineering. And it, it, there are so many classes that were even outside of that. And I, I took dance, history, all these type of classes. I didn't know what I wanted to do, but I just wanted to learn and have all of these opportunities to see where my, where my uh, future will go through. Um, and, and so I think you should definitely take advantage of, of that uh, while you're here is, is learn about the different subjects because a lot of times you don't really know where you want to be in the future. Uh, so you now in terms of what I do now, I, I actually lead a startup, uh, actually involved in two startups now. I'm, I'm the CEO of a startup for microfluidics, which is basically, uh, think of testing a drop of blood to know if you're healthy or not and, and working on very low cost instruments. Uh, and this was basically my, my grad research that I went into uh, for biomedical engineering. That's where I got my PhD in. Uh, but that, that pathway was a very planned pathway when I went to grad school <coughs> uh, because I worked in between grad school and undergrad. And you know, after going through all the majors in undergrad and then working and, and seeing how kind of business works and how life science companies can do such a major difference in people's lives, that's what kind of put me in a path to go to grad school and then eventually run my own company. Uh, so yeah, I guess those were all the questions. I have a lot so, to say after that. I think everyone kind of answered my next question already. When did you decide to become a STEM major and why? So everyone kind of touched on that, so we'll kind of skip over that one. But what have been the highs and lows of your program so far? So either, why don't you, everybody just touch on a high or a low? But don't everyone pick highs, because those are easier. <laughs> so if there's some low in there that was something you struggled with while you were here, tell us about that, because I think, you know, we have mostly fresh women here, so, you know, what were you, you know, they're, they're just starting. So what, what, did, what did you encounter? I think one of the highs in terms of the academics, at least, is that the courses really never get uh, boring. Sometimes they get tedious because you work with a lot of numbers, but it's always interesting what you're learning. It, I never felt like, oh, I'm going to have to, like, memorize this and then uh, have it in my short-term memory during the test and then forget it right afterwards because you actually use it for the next class so you'll be in trouble if you do that. And um, as far as the lows go, uh, I remember I had a lot of friends that weren't in engineering, and then um, they have a lot more free time, I'm noticing. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I'd always be like doing my homework on a Friday night because it's due online, and then I'd see my friends going out. So sometimes it gets uh, tough. The coursework is heavy, but I think it's worth it because I feel like if I switched to another major, I would be bored. Um, also, to add on to that, if you pick something that interests you, um, I feel like you'll never get bored. So you never get bored of that class. There are so many times when I have a really hard class and I just don't know how to get through all of this, but every day going to lecture, learning these new things, it fascinates me, you know, because that's my interest. I like <laughs> my major and I like what I, what, what I learn. So uh, it's really important to make sure that, like she, like she said earlier, just explore your options and pick something that you really like. It's not about uh, picking an easy major or something that you can, you think you can manage, but it's also about what are your interests. This is something that you're passionate about. Because if you are passionate, regardless of if it's hard or easy, you will still get through it. So um, yeah, that's that's what I wanted to say. And uh, for the highs, um, it's, 
all the, the because this is a research uni university, you have a lot of opportunities to um, get involved in research and kind of learn more about these things, these basic things that you're learning in class. So by learning all these basics, you you can still explore them in um, a real life project or help a professor do a real life project. And so I think that's a great um, opportunity that we have here, just because this is a UC campus and we have a um, we have a lot of research um, options. <coughs> um, a low, I would say, is for engineering in particular. Um, the The curriculum is very uh, strict in the sense that most of these classes you have to take in order um, to go to the next one. So one is a prereq for the other. So let's say you did bad in one class or you have to retake it. If you don't plan it well enough, you could be a whole year uh, behind before you even know it. And it could be just that one class that you failed or got a C minus in, but you just cannot move on um, until you get the grade that you need. So, um, so it's important that, it, I don't think it's a bad thing, but it is important that you meet with your counselors and advisors often and um, plan things out because UCI has so many resources to help people from all different backgrounds. Um, it's just a matter of students making use of it and knowing where to go. And if you don't know where to go, you can ask anybody and they will they might redirect you to five different people, but still, at the end of the day, um, you have to, you came here to study and you know, once you get your degree, you might not even be seeing these people. So j don't worry if somebody's judgmental to you because you know, <laughs> I know so many people are just worried about what people think. It doesn't matter what they think. As long as you accomplish it and you did it the right way, then it <coughs> um, So in, in school, I mean, maybe your lows might be just being in a team project and, and having it just go to, to heck uh, <laughs> because you know someone's not helping or you're doing all the work or something like that. But in terms of high, or highs and lows in school, I think I learned a lot um, after working and um, and experiencing a lot of things outside of school that you will you don't expect uh, you'll be experiencing, and here's an example. Um, when I started working, I was introduced. Uh, there were about five or six engineers. I was the only engineer um, introduced, and we went to a training session. And the guy that was leading that training session would not answer any of my questions. <laughs> only directed all his attention to the male engineers. Um, and um, it was, he was kind of rude and later on I found out that all the rest of the engineers in their intro ended up getting like this, this email for resources to, to go further in the, in the company and he didn't send it to me and everyone knew that like wow he was really kind of <laughs> uh, basically ignoring me and, and I felt in those first six months, I was <coughs> way hard to, to try to press people to, to, to do a lot of troubleshooting and help the company move forward in different projects. And down the road, I hear kind of from that same person is that, wow, that woman could probably be a CEO of a company in the future. <laughs> and uh, that always stuck with me. I mean, you know, that this one terrible incident of this guy just kind of ignoring me as like, like this woman engineer. Um, and then, and then, and I still, I still kind of experience that even as uh, leading this company. Uh, you know, I've had investors tell me that, well, a woman, you know, once she gets a family, once she gets pregnant, it's basically over. <laughs> and and like you know, they say this directly to my face. And the funny thing is that I think it, to be a woman is I think we're so much more creative than men. <laughs> like, and that that. We are smart as, or smart enough, or smart, or even smarter than men to be good engineers. And uh, the creativity, I think, is the best. Like, think of all the like the most amazing things that women make just by crafts and art. And if you just familiarize yourself with engineering and knowledge, you will understand it just as well or better than men. And be and add that creativity to the engineering discipline. Um, so, so you. When you get into these lows, you, you, you'll, you'll kind of see your, that reputation, but I think it's, it is changing, and I'm very hopeful and, and positive that, uh, that there'll be more and more women like, you know, like these girls and like you guys, you girls, uh, to, to really make an impact in our field. Uh. So in regards to highs and lows, um, 
branching off from engineering more so and entering biology, um, one of the things that really stuck with me was in one of the very basic intro, I think it was like an orientation course that we had to take. Uh, one of the first few things that were said was, you know, look around your classroom. I think it was like 300, 400 students and there were several of those. Half of those students won't be there anymore because biology is such an impacting major that there's so many students that are entering as biology or anything similar. And so even um, as you go through it, um, there's so much challenges in regards to getting that one-on-one -on -one individual interaction with professors and you know getting sometimes that help that you need. But you always have to fight for it. And at the same time, because there's so many students as well that do need biology, there's a lot of resources that are available and different opportunities that are offered for those students who do reach out for them. So it's really kind of like a battle. I mean, you're in this whole pool of so many students who are also, whether it's medicine more particularly or any other different types of health field, you really have to fight for what you want to do and find out what it is that you like in particular about anything in terms of medicine or health or not even, it could be like just pure biology research too. So it's like a both high and a low. You can be really impacted but also, it gives you a chance to meet a lot of other peers who are also interested in what you're doing and also <coughs> kind of sharing that struggle. So you meet a lot of close people, granted not everyone, but the few that you actually stick along with. So. Angela. I guess like um, all these panelists have mentioned something that, uh, wait, what are we trying to say? Okay, um, let's try again. So I guess like I want to summarize what the panelists have already said, which is basically, uh, they are very passionate. Uh, they're, they have very great goals, big goals, but uh, in order to achieve them, that, that is their low. Like, there is um, a lot of things that they have to do to push farther ahead uh, in order to achieve their passions. And in terms of me, in terms of my situation, it is uh, to achieve this dance and computer science like uh, blend. For me, it's like uh, I'm taking both dance classes as well as computer science classes, so that takes a lot of time from my schedule. Um, like I think, is that your name? Um, Becky? Yes. Uh, um, she said something like all her friends were uh, going to party or something, <laughs> going to have fun on Friday nights uh, while she was staying at home uh, doing homework. So that happens a lot for me as well. Uh, it's just like, or the main thing for me is I have to walk to uh, the computer science <laughs> Opposite sides of the campus. Like, <laughs> sometimes there are classes that are like right next to each other, but I have to rush over to the other side. So there are just some things that you have to, um, you have to sacrifice or that you have to push through in order to achieve your passions. And uh, the reason why that those things are worth it is because uh, it makes you happy. Yeah. And still these people have all this time to run programs <coughs> and be leaders and everything else too. So um, I'm going to finish with one question for everybody and try and just kind of answer quickly because we want to have some time for the audience. But so as I mentioned earlier, these most of the people in the audience are fresh women. So not fresh men, fresh women um, or first year transfer students perhaps, but still fresh women to UCI. And so how can they, what experience do you have to give them that will help them be successful at UCI? Um, what resources on campus have you found useful? And how can they kind of jumpstart their time here? Uh, Let's start at that end. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> can you repeat the question? Angela. Can you repeat the question? Oh, sure. So how can they, how can they be successful? What resources have you found useful to kind of lead to your success? or? How could they jumpstart their time here? What what kind of things would you advise them to do now since they're just starting? Okay, so um, I guess for me, uh, I knew what I was going to go through, uh, or the, the subjects I want to tackle, which was dance and technology. So for me, uh, I just uh, took the computer science classes that I was involved in, and I also took dance classes. And I guess like my first advice would be to decide what are the the subjects that you want to um, look into. Um, I have a friend who wants to do project management so and also was interested in um, just doing business. So I guess like for him, he chose to delve himself into those two things. And for me, I guess what I'm trying to say is 
if you're interested in a few subjects, go ahead and um, you know take your time and uh, try to learn more about that subject. And whatever the way that may be, that may be with <coughs> uh, clubs, that may be with uh, going to the career center, or um, maybe you know taking more classes in that area. I guess my advice is to quickly do those things because. Uh, you might realize that, oh shoot, I don't really like to do that. Then what happens then? So uh, it's like quickly do it. If you realize that you don't want to, you, you don't like that subject anymore, quickly go to another subject uh, and utilize the four years that you have at UCI. Okay. For me, I would say start with academics first. Make sure you get some kind of study foundation that you have at least to start with so that you can continue that throughout the remaining four years. So once you have that down, then afterwards you can focus on everything else that you even possibly want to do, whether it's opportunities, research, volunteering, anything. But build it off slowly. So make sure you have that foundation first, and then once you have that, make sure you go explore and have fun. There's so many resources that are available, whether for academics, so like peer tutoring or longer, that's offered for certain courses, more particularly bio or, than I know. but afterwards or otherwise professors and your peers are also great resources because they're doing what you're doing as well or they already have done it and just know that no matter what you do whether it's you know research hospital work or anything else just make sure that you enjoy it so don't do anything that you are doing just for the resume or just for just for something you have to do to get to get over it. I mean, granted, you will have to do something like that, at least to find out whether you like it or not, or to reach out for other opportunities, but obviously don't stick with it. So something is, if you're doing something that you don't like, because I know there are a lot of students who engage in research sometimes because they have to, if you find that after a certain point you just don't like it anymore, then make sure you, you know, branch out and go to something that you do like. Because commitment is one thing. But you want to stay committed to something that you actually love doing, so go for finding out what that is first. I mean, um, so quickly, mentors. I think if you find a mentor, that would that helped me a lot. To find someone that was maybe four or five years ahead of me, maybe 10, 20 years ahead of me. I have several mentors, and and having a coffee break, a lunch break with them is very just helpful um, to to kind of clear the path of where. where what direction you want to be in, and as well as you yourself could be a mentor to other people, like the, the younger uh, folks in high school as well, and or even middle school. Um, I think uh, being a mentor and then being a mentee, uh, being a mentee uh, just develops you as a person, and will help you uh, succeed at UCLA. Yeah. Um, I would say being confident, being confident is very important. If you have noticed, uh, the guys in the classroom, <laughs> they ask, when the teachers ask some questions. They say it with so much confidence, even if they don't know. Um, <laughs> you know, um, research shows that too. Yeah. It proves it. Yeah, you can notice that in classes too. You might have a better answer than what they said, but it's just you are hesitant, and they don't. They're not afraid to try, or they're not afraid afraid to speak up, even if it's wrong. They, they're okay with that. You know, they don't take it too personally. If it if it's wrong, okay, cool, it's wrong. Then you move on. So I would say that's very important. Don't don't be afraid to try new things. Um, if there's an interview opportunity that you're not maybe very very interested in, still try it out. It doesn't hurt. Um, you know, keep track of your questions. You can learn from them later. So uh, it, it you know if you don't get the interview, if you don't get the job, not not a big deal. Just move on. So keep moving forward. Uh, be persistent about what you need to get done, and that way you can be successful even if there are so many people who are trying to pull you down. Exactly. For, for me, I think the greatest resources I found on campus were my professors, uh, whether that was with class, if I needed help understanding the subject I was learning, or if I needed someone to talk to about something personal that was going in my, on in my life, or if um, I had no idea what I wanted to do at school or what classes I should take. They, they really gave me insight into that, and I think, um, yeah, that would be my greatest resource. So do we have a question from the audience? In the back. Oh, hear me? Uh,
but I'm really interested in research, and I've never experienced that before. So I've looked uh, at the UROP website, and um, I'm just wondering, I haven't, I've taken all the program classes, but I haven't done what every professor suggested, which was to work on a personal project. I just didn't have time. I was working full-time going to, uh, I was working part-time going to school full-time, and this quarter is the first time that I've been able to just uh, devote myself to school. And I've just been trying to keep up with everything this quarter. And um, my fear is that um, with uh, with research that they want to kind of have you hit the ground running. What has been your experience with research? Is it more like a classroom situation where if you don't know what's going on, they'll give you help, or where they really just want somebody who's super independent and can just pick stuff up as it gets dropped? Um, so research labs, uh, they have different cultures in them. Uh, some of them, they, they'd like you to be more independent, while others have, uh, you'll have colleagues there to kind of help you along the way. And you know, and if you're undergraduate, usually it's the, the graduate that, that's kind of mentoring the undergrad. Um, and, and the undergrad is usually helping um, a project that uh, the graduate has already uh, begun. And so that's a good place to start. And so long as you're just transparent on your, your, your schedule, uh, they'll, most of them will be willing to, to deal with, yeah, <laughs> to accept whatever your schedule is. Um, you know, there is some quarters where a, a researcher would be gone the whole the like, time. Maybe like I saw them like three times in that whole quarter, and then one, qu you know, another quarter where they're almost there almost every day. Um, but so long as they were telling us um, their schedule, we were okay with it. Do Zeppi or Diane want to address that a little bit? Because I know you guys have been involved in research recently too. In terms of the professor, you said like if they expect you to sort of hit the ground running, I think it depends on the professor. For for example, my engineering professor, he gave me an entire computer language and course and he said, do it. And he didn't give me any help. And when I asked him for help, he was like, do it yourself. <laughs> so, but my, my physics professor that I do research with is like the opposite and he always asks me if I ask questions, if I have questions before I even get to ask the questions, but um, I think it depends because they want you, the independence is important in research because you're not always going to have someone working by your side, but you are working in a team, so collaboration is a part of it. And Diane, how did you find your professor to do research with? So I had two very different experiences with research because for clinical research, um, I actually applied through a program and so the emergency department had this kind of clinical team where everyone conducted research for the same, there was like 12 different studies going on and we all com uh, collected data for that. So that was more like a team collaboration rather than your own individual project. So you had that kind of support and it wasn't necessarily, oh, you know, you have to go off by yourself doing whatever you have to do, but everyone was there for you. <laughs> uh, more recently in the summer, so I joined the organic chemistry research, and that sounds more similar to that, where you're in a particular group and they have their own culture, their own environment, and how they run things. And um, at the start, especially, there will be someone there to kind of, or well, depending, to help you and like introduce you into whatever you're going to do in your own project. But afterwards, eventually, you will kind of develop your own independence in that as well. So, in terms of flexibility, though, it really ranges depending on the group and who you. We'll work with okay. and, and being a faculty member in computer science or in ICS, I'll add to that a little bit, which is information in computer sciences is really broad. Yeah. And so once you find out an area that you're kind of interested in as you go through upper division classes, I would go talk to the professor afterwards or the TA even. Because lots of times the TAs, not always, but sometimes the TAs are associated with the professor and you can kind of figure that out, you know, whether they're just a TA for the class or they have another relationship with the professor in terms of the, because sometimes we pick our own student to be our TA because we know how to work with them. So, but I would talk to the professor about, you know, do you have any research opportunities? And you might be doing it for, you know, kind of more of a, on an internship basis, meaning you're not getting paid at first, but that's a good way to get started. And then you know, after a professor realizes that you're actually doing something useful, they sometimes have funding to, to support you. So, and I'd be happy to talk to you after, afterwards too. Okay. So. Great. I didn't even know paid research was an option. Pardon me? I didn't even know paid research was an 
Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so in fact, there are two, the Europe and, and Surf IT in the summer offer these programs where you get two or three thousand dollars for the summer to actually do research. So those are both summer programs that happen. Um, Surf IT is specifically around activities within Cal IT2 here, but there's a lot of computer science. <laughs> okay. So, another question. Oh, she's, she's escaping. <laughs> Grab a sandwich on your way out. <laughs> uh, as international students, uh, we have fewer advantages than American citizens. So how can we improve, improve our uh, competitiveness in the job market? Anybody have a take on that? Uh, well, oh. one of the, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> I mean, I, One of the barriers is is basically if, if the company can sponsor yeah. uh, working, and so that so so that's of course a big barrier to, to uh, begin with for an international student. Um, but in terms of you know just getting a, a job, uh, I would do a lot more outside of just academics, um, like being involved with you know engineering. Uh, clubs or, or even research as well, doing projects where you're actually you know, hands-on and being part of a team. Uh, because a lot of times GPA hasn't really, they don't really care actually. <laughs> and in fact, sometimes uh, a lot of hirers tell me, well, why don't, uh, do, you, do you know anything about business? It's like, this is totally out of engineering <laughs> because you go to a company and, and they're like, well, we, we have to make money somehow too, and if you kind of have the bigger picture, they you have a better chance of uh, making an impression on them as well. Um, if English is not your first language too, I would definitely go to the resources out here from like the international uh, student. Uh, I think there's a center here for international <coughs> students, you know, to help you, you know, gain that, uh, you know, not not only just speaking but also um, writing and. And that get, getting that kind of mentorship from, from, from them will help you a lot as well. So. I would say too, internships. So usually on your student visa, you can do internships in the summertime. Um, so that's one way to do it that would be very useful. And then I think the other thing that I had in mind, which I'm forgetting now because I'm at that age. <laughs> um, uh, oh, um, I'll think of it. <laughs> you guys have something? Hi. Um, have you guys ever feel like giving up because classes are too challenging and like tedious? If yes, like how do you guys overcome it? Yeah, you all go through that time when <laughs> you just want to give up on everything and run away from here. but. <laughs> Uh, but then you realize you can't do it because you came this far and you just have to always uh, encourage yourself to push, you know, go a little bit more and a little bit more. So I would say uh, my <coughs> advice is to take, take it one step at a time. Just take one day and see, okay, what do I need to get done for today? Or what do I need to get done for this week? So instead of saying, oh my God, I have three more years of this much stress, how do I do this? So don't do all of that. It's not going to help you. Uh, plus, it's going to hurt you because you won't be able to perform. You're stressing out. Um, you can't do your best. So uh, the way I do it is I plan for one week. Um, and unless I have a midterm the week after or something, because then I always mark my calendars for that. So I, can, I know ahead how to plan things out. Uh, and I make use of my weekends. So um, I go out and have fun, but that's only one small por portion of my weekend. That's not the majority of the time. Uh, Friday nights, I kind of just relax and, you know, um, just have that time for myself, but over the weekend I make a use of that time to um, ca catch up in my classes or get a little bit ahead, um, things like that. So I think with good planning, um, planning, like I said, like one step at a time, um, you will be much, it will be much easier on you and you won't stress out as much. And on top of that, you'll, you'll know exactly what needs to get done and you will have it done. Make sure you take breaks, without a doubt. I mean, yeah. you're, you're gonna be hitting the ground running whenever you, you know, dive right into it. 
but there will always be times when it just gets too stressful, so take a pause, you know, smell the flowers, <laughs> get some, do something else that you also enjoy, whether it's dance or whether it's, you know, just going to the beach every once in a while. Join the ark. Join, or join the ark. Mm -hmm. It's Make free sure. for you guys. <laughs> oh, we, we actually paid for it, right? Well, <laughs> yeah, you paid for so, it. You pay for it whether you use it or not. <laughs> true, true. Yeah, like go rock climbing at the ark or whatever yes. you do enjoy every once in a while or however frequently you do need to do it. And go to Aldrich Park in the evenings. It's really beautiful out there. <laughs> true, true. But um, I know that, uh, at least for me being a bio major, all my roommates initially, we all started out as bio, all four of us total. And one by one, every one of them slowly started dropping out. And so there wasn't a lot of support in that sense where they struggled a lot and I've seen it each one of them failed in that aspect, whether biology wasn't right for them or that it was just too difficult and the transition from high school was just unbearable. So I would say no matter what, you know, you've sacrificed a lot or you will come to sacrifice a lot just by doing what you do. So make sure that it's something that is worth it and that you do enjoy. So struggle through to find out whether it is right for you and, you know, live your life at the same time by doing so. Can I add something? Mm -hmm. I, I also think it helps finding support groups. You're going to find out that you'll be seeing a lot of the same faces in your classes and you'll end up signing up for classes with your friends and um, it really, in, from my experience at least, it really helps to get together in groups and like go over the homework a couple days before the midterm or do review for your final exam um, or your quizzes and I, it kind of helps knowing that like, oh, you know, there's other people out there who are taking the same workload as me and uh, if they can get through it, I can get through it too. So, I mean, you're gonna get stressed out without a doubt because it's a high stress major, but um, you're not alone. So, it, it it helps to have a support group. More questions? <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> So our lead and Jathan, I think, I already touched on it because he talked about the person that scuffed you and being more confident. But I'm <coughs> curious as to how the other panelists anticipate how others will snub them in the future and how to respond to that. Like, what is your personal approach to reacting to someone that is treating you unfairly because you are a woman and underrepresented? Like, how do you want to respond to that adversity? Uh, I, ha I haven't had any experience like that yet. Um, I've had a lot of people show like surprise or shock when I tell them what my major is, or I, I have reactions like, oh, shouldn't you be in anthropology or something? Or like, what are you doing in calculus? Sociology. Yeah, exactly. But um, just show them that, you know, like just because you're a girl doesn't mean you are less capable than them. Uh, I certainly hope after hearing Sorry, I forgot your name. Arlene. Arlene. I hope after hearing Arlene's story that uh, maybe by the time we're in the field, after a few years, there will be more women and we won't face something as bad as she did. But uh, I don't think it's fair for us to have to work. Uh, one of my engineering professors said women have to work uh, twice as hard to earn half the credit. So hopefully um, <laughs> you can just show that, you know, like it doesn't matter. <coughs> you, as long as you're performing at the same level as them, you should be regarded as equal. And did that engineering professor think that was true no, or was no, just saying was, that was the reality of life? Yeah, he was yes. just okay. joking about it. <laughs> he wasn't telling you you had to do that to no, get the A. He was, he was telling us about <laughs> or, the story To get the C <laughs> when the guy got the A for half yeah. the work. <laughs> I would say without a doubt, persevering. So I haven't experienced it myself so much or even if I have, I just let it bypass me because it shouldn't, I mean, it will come up without a doubt no matter what you do. And I know for my mentor, she's um, she's a neurosurgeon at UCI Medical Center. And in neurosurgery, it's a lot it's more male dominated as well. So she does experience that and has her peers and her friends who are also doing that experience that as well. And so even though it does happen, you know, you have to fight it regardless and continue on whatever happens. I guess <coughs> for me, I, uh, I haven't, personally uh, felt that kind of discrimination. Uh, there were some subtle things like uh, I was working in a game project where I was the only girl 
and it was just a little awkward because I was the only girl and uh, I couldn't, or showers. Huh? I said I'm the only one that took a shower. <laughs> uh, it was kind of small sometimes. Yeah. Um, but uh, for that case, uh, they were all very nice, so it was okay. Um, but I have been talking to a few people and uh, they gave me the advice of um, kind of playing to that kind of, um, that, what's it called again? Uh, playing with, to that stereotype. So somebody meets you uh, for the first time and that person has an, uh, a, an initial impression of you. Um, and usually that impression for women is that they're not as competent. So um, some people suggested, you know, play to that kind of uh, stereotype, but then at the end, surprise them. Surprise them with how much you know and how good you are, actually. So, um, like, when you surprise them, then uh, they'll realize, oh, she actually knows what she's talking about. And uh, they'll, they'll have more respect for you in that way. So, I guess, like, yeah, uh, same for what you guys have said. Uh, persevere and also show them that you are on the same level. Yeah. If not higher. Yeah. <laughs> I think Chitana's um, point about Chitana? Chaitana. Chaitana. Mm -hmm. Point about confidence is really important too, and to sort of not let it. I mean, when you do get snubbed, or when you know someone's not calling on you, or something, is just just really speak out with confidence that you know the answer to this. And don't feel inferior about it. Even in life, yeah. there are so many people who tell you you can't do it. So just because if it's engineering, we, we have that inferiority that, oh my God, we're the only people, uh, the very few people in this group. So don't think like that. Just remove that uh, from your mind and kind of then inject that confidence into you and it should work. One more, oh, we got two more, okay. I have a specific question. Um, what kind of research does physics students do? It, it depends what you choose. For me, I chose particle physics. So, um, like with my professor, I do a lot of computational work, but you can go into like mechanics if you want to, electricity and magnetism if you want to. For those, I'm not really sure what you'd have to do, but there's a bunch of different uh, subsections, I guess you can call them, in physics, and you get to choose which one you want to do research in. And for research, if there's a class that interests you, then talk to that professor because most likely that professor is doing research in that subject, you know? So that's the best way to um, narrow it down to a couple of topics to see what classes are interesting you. And we had one down here. Yeah. Um, hi, um, I'm a transfer student. Oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> and I know a lot of people have done research like your second year, or third year, and fourth year. And so, um, doing research and also as well as internships, we need like a type of like, um, our lineup for an internship, we need like background check, and as well as do research, we need to have like um, papers, I guess, um, if that's true or not. Um, is there a way that I can do research without having any type of Allowing me to work, I guess. It's just, I don't know if you have to work um, I don't have any kind of paper that will allow me to work. Um, and so. You mean, you mean. Uh, I'm a dreamer. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, um, let, let, yeah. Uh, thank you for asking that question. Yeah, really that's a great question. It. Because um, uh, there are resources uh, for all students, including AB 540 students, to participate in our internships and research opportunities. Is that in here in Cali? Because I just. In California. Uh, uh, no, I mean like the general physics program. No, 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 in the University of California. At um, this campus, this including campus. Uh, the various schools, I'm assuming Cal IT, uh, there's an individual by the name of Anna uh, Barragan. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, I know, I know her. You know, and she could her, provide a great source of orientation. Mm -hmm. um, but you put your finger on something because we're trying to uh, explain to more faculty and offices that AB 540 students, if they're eligible, you know, based on their GPA or uh, prerequisites, that they can participate in the array of research and internship opportunities. Okay. Um, but so should I just like open up myself to the teachers and 
let them know about the bag or be part of the research event. Exactly. Yes. Exactly. exactly. Just like anybody else. Exactly. It's about what you want to do and what you know. Okay. And is that the same way for internships here from UCI? Like in Europe, I, I haven't been to um, that study or anything like that. So oh, yeah, yeah, for the undergraduate research opportunities program, sure. Mm -hmm. Is that also what I can do it? Yeah. yeah. You, so have it most any, most of some of you participated in the undergraduate research opportunity program, and can you describe how you signed up for it? Mm, for at least for Europe, since they offer a lot of different opportunities within that as well, um, I would say it's particular to your own research group. So you kind of like submit a proposal based on the work that you're doing. So it's not so much limited to oh because you know you can't do it. Up. But you do need at least a group that you are a part of to have your own research project that you can submit. But otherwise, it should be fine. I've had no. Or to join. I mean, yeah. so I've had students that haven't been doing research with me in the past who have come and talked to me after a class, and we've come up with a project, and we've submitted a proposal for that project, and it's been funded either for Cal IT for, for the SERP IT, which is specifically here in Cal IT two, but it's the same. It's also part of the undergraduate research opportunities programs at UC Irvine. So you don't necessarily have to start out having already done some research. There are other ways to kind of get involved with that. So, and I, yeah, I just want to Sherry. add that for our CERF IT program, they would be Cal IT2, and we also have a program that will start um, winter quarter called the Multidisciplinary Design sure. Program. You can look for both of those programs on the URLOP website. And those programs, um, <coughs> professors submit the project ahead of time, so you can review all the projects that are listed on Great. the website. But I would just add to that, that if there's one that really interests you, I would go talk to the faculty member. Because if they're looking at the applications and they've got five people interested and you've already talked to them, it, it'll make a difference, you know, unless you make a bad impression. But, you know, <laughs> um, but it'll make a difference that you're really interested. Because, I mean, you write a statement for these programs that basically says why you're interested in this project. But if you can talk it out, I think that really helps. Yeah, maybe I can add uh, for the MVP project, uh, it will start in winter time. Uh, it January. Is a, yeah, it's a multidisciplinary uh, design program. And usually it requires teamwork. Yeah. So um, we will provide up to $3,000 match for the project itself, but it will not provide the funding for the students' the stipends. But for the summer program, that is about two to three thousand dollars stipend for the internship within Cali too. So there's two different programs. And the you know even the <coughs> one in the, in the winter, the MVP program, multidisciplinary program. Even though you're not getting paid, you're getting really valuable experience. Right. Yeah. So um, I would say for international students, that's another way of really getting something that's going to make your record look different to a potential employer in the future. You will be able to uh, work with a team of students and faculty are coming from two different schools, so you will have a chance to two learn two from uh, two mentors. Yeah. More than two. More than two, yeah. <laughs> okay, unless someone has a really burning question, there is actually some refreshments in the lobby and you can talk to anybody um, who's going to be out there and ask individual questions if you think of something later or didn't want to raise your hand. So I'd like to start first though by thanking all the panelists. And then the other thing is I want to tell you about future events. So on January 14th, we're having another one of these workshops that's specifically focused on internships and research opportunities. Okay, so come back for that one. But when does the MDP um, applications come out? 
So uh, we just received uh, 17 applications. So from faculty. From faculty. Faculty so, fairs. Yeah, 17 uh, project. Mm -hmm. So we will make an announcement probably within two weeks. So it's uh, probably around end of November. Okay. It will be announced, and you can go to Europe uh, website. Europe.uci.edu. Mm -hmm. But when are their applications due? Probably before this. They are. They're yeah. before. So November, middle of November, the applications will be available. You're going to have to apply before this quarter ends. Right. So, so those MDP program applications are due before, <coughs> let's just say December 15th. Yeah. I don't know what the date is exactly, but keep that, that in mind. We're, our schedule's a little off this quarter. So. And then on Wednesday, April 15th, we're having another one on entrepreneurial and career opportunities. So this one was specifically targeted at first year students, first year women. This is really targeted for women students. So come, but even though you're, it, the other ones are just as good for you because you'll get an early start on internships, research opportunities, entrepreneurship. Please so we will see you back. And bring your friends, please. You'll have more by then. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Deborah. Lots of sandwiches and yeah. everything.